glory is the realm of magnificence that our God dwells in. The Psalms, it says he dwells in light that no man can comprehend. And some of the people that say they've been there, seen it, said, uh, there's so much more than the colors of the rainbow or any earthly colors. It's just this magnificent glow of unimaginable colors and glory. And I think that's a, an appropriate way to describe his glory is light, although light is energy. And so I like to think of God as the most powerful energy in all the realm. And he used some of that glory to create the world. And everything that we now have in existence came from him as a part of him. And, and he made it. And when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the angels announced it this way, glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. At one point, Jesus said, Father, restore unto me the glory that I had with you in the beginning. And we're going to see how that came to pass. Because Jesus left his glory and his heavenly powers aside, and he walked about and ministered in this earth in a human body, conceived by the Holy Spirit, but he walked about in a human body with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And everything he did, he said, I don't do it myself, but the Spirit in me works through me. And that's important because if that's how Christ lived, we can live that way also. We can have the glory of God revealed to us in these earthly bodies. See, it says, Jesus received from God the Father honor and glory at his baptism. He received honor and glory. He was there born in a manger, living in a human body. And at this baptism, he received honor and glory. And God spoke from heaven and said, this is my son who I love very much. And I'm really pleased and proud of him. But at that point, he received glory. And we're going to see how we can have that as well. But that's where the glory started. I believe Adam had it, lost it. Jesus had that glory in heaven with the Father, laid it aside. But as he obeyed the Lord in baptism, the glory was restored back to him. In fact, he acknowledged that, and even towards the end of his ministry, speaking to scribes and Pharisees, said this, The hour has come when the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, there was a glory that descended on him in baptism, but the greatest glory and honor came to him at resurrection. And we're going to see that in a minute. And he said, unless a, a grain of a seed of corn or wheat falls into the ground and dies, it's alone. You know, Bill over here would buy packets of seed, sweet corn seed, but as long as you keep it in the package, it doesn't multiply, doesn't grow, it just lays there dormant. But if you put it in the ground and you add water and sunshine, it multiplies and you get hundreds of kernels back for that one that you plant. And that's what Jesus was saying. If I plant my body, if I give my body, even though it dies, out of that is going to spring up an incredible harvest an abundant harvest, and it will bring forth much fruit. That's us. We're the good fruit. Jesus is the seed that was buried and raised up into new life, and we're the fruit of all of that that's happened there. Jesus laid aside that glory. He desired to have it back, and I believe the glory of the latter is even greater than the glory of the beginning. Because here's the bargain. You got Tim and Tracy in the deal. You got Jim and Linda. You got Kevin and Amy. You got uh, each one of you that believe and trust him. That's the harvest that he got for being willing and obedient to the Father. After his death and resurrection, one of the dynamic sermons preached by Peter from Acts chapter 3. They're all there like, what's happening? This Holy Ghost revival's going on and... These must be a bunch of drunk guys from last night carrying on. And Peter said, no, no, we're not drunk with wine, as you suppose. We are drunk on the Holy Spirit. We're under the influence of the Holy Spirit for sure. But this is not drunkenness from wine. 
But this is what God promised he would send to those that believe. And then he gets real pointed at me and says, you, 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 you killed the prince of glory. You killed the prince of life. But God has raised him from the dead. See, that's why I think it's arrogant for men to think that we cause pollution that's going to end the earth. And it's even more arrogant to think we can fix it. There's a God who created this earth and this planet, and he's in charge. He's the one that's in charge. And he's got a plan and a timetable for the earth. I guarantee you when the time comes, he'll fix it. He'll fix it. Arrogant man thinks they can fix it. I don't care how many trillions you spend. This world cannot solve its own problems. They make them worse. Government is not the answer. It's a problem. I mean, you need government and... Paul said, obey those that have rule over you if it doesn't violate God's word and your principles. Uh, but I see a lot going on in government and leadership that isn't of God. And I'm like Peter on this morning. I'd like to point to some people and say, you're going in the wrong direction. You're violating God's laws. You're going against what God planned and ordained for us to have. You killed the Prince of Glory. I took this picture because he's nailed to the cross. I love the scene in the Passion of the Christ. He carries his cross up there, stumbles, falls. They lay the cross there, and he climbs over onto the cross and rolls over on top of it. See, he said, nobody kills me. You don't take my life. I lay it down. I choose to do this because he knew this was God's plan. In the garden, he said, Lord, if there's any other way, if it's possible, take this cup of wrath from me. But he said, nevertheless, I know what your will is. And at the end of the suffering on the cross, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I've told that to a lot of the saints of God. I told that to my dad every night. Dad, even if you can't talk, say it in your mind, in your spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Don't fight to stay here. You've got better stuff ahead. Jesus went to the cross willingly. Now, that doesn't excuse the scribes and Pharisees and the people that crucified him. But he went there and he took those nails in his hands, not because the Romans were dirty, nasty people. They, some of them were. He took the nails in the palm of his hands because he loved Maggie and Lou and Dee and Linda. He loves you and you and you. Who is there in your life that you would die for? Most of us would die for a spouse or even our kids. What about a good friend? What about a neighbor? What about somebody you don't like? What about somebody that's mean and nasty to you? Jesus died for those Roman soldiers who nailed him to the cross. Jesus died for those scribes and Pharisees who hated him. And at the end, as he died, the thunder and lightning and rain that fell, the Roman centurion said, surely this was the Son of God. So Mary and the disciples saw him die on the cross. He told them, I'm going to spend three days in the heart of the earth like Jonah was in the whale. But you destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. I'll be back. They didn't kill him. He chose to let that happen. But it says God raised him from the dead. It wasn't possible for death to hold him. He's eternal life. He's abundant life. He created the universe. He said the words that I speak are spiritual and they have life in them. More than just human life, they have spiritual life in them. And the real word there in the Greek is quick, which means quickening, which to give life, to bring to life. That's what the Word of God can do. That's what Jesus did on the third day. That's what he wants to do in our life, to quicken us and make us alive in the Spirit and to experience and enjoy what we have with God. God raised him from the dead and glorified him. Say, he was praying, Lord, restore unto me the glory. Well, 
at the resurrection. Yes, he got a, an anointing at baptism, but at Resurrection Sunday, this day as we're celebrating, he was glorified by the Father. I love Hebrews 1. I think that's the prayer God said on uh, about raising Jesus. And Jesus said, this day you have begotten me. This day you have exalted me and given me a throne above all so that every knee will bow. Even the angels in heaven, every knee will bow and confess Jesus is Lord. Like the Roman soldier. Truly that was the Son of God. But sadly, there would be a lot of them who say, I missed it. I missed it. You know, I've heard people say over the years, well, I think everybody's going to heaven. Well, I've come to agree with them to a certain point. Everybody is going to heaven because there's a great white throne judgment and they're all going to be there. God's going to raise everybody from the dead. They're all going to get new bodies and they all stand there at the great white throne judgment in heaven. The problem is they're not all going to stay there. Depart from me. I don't know you. Hey, Depart from me. I don't know you. I don't find your name here. Depart into everlasting punishment. Everybody's going to heaven and they may get that little glimpse of what God's like. It's not going to be a good thing. It's going to be a terrible thing. You know, I, I really believe, I, I'm just so happy this weekend. My dad's body died on Thursday. Ron's body died on Friday. And I say, here's these two bodies left behind, dead, like Jesus' dead body was placed in the tomb. And then at God's appointed time, they were resurrected to new life. See, I believe when a body dies, it says to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. The minute you take your last breath, angels, they're there. They carried Lazarus into paradise. And I think that's true for everybody. He's there to escort us back into the presence of God. Um, the good news is we not only get born again in our spirit, our souls are saved from hell. But he said, I got a new body waiting for you. I'm going to give you a glorified body like he intended for Adam and Eve to have, and they lost it. We're going to have a glorified body like the one that came out of the tomb. Jesus, in his resurrection power, that's what we're going to have. New glorious bodies that will never die. That's the good news. The bad news is you can't get your new body till you get rid of the old one. You know what I found so true over the years? God will never ask you to give up something that you have in your hand and we hold on to it too tightly sometimes. God says, let go of that. Let go of that. Yeah, but I like this. I want this. But if you let go of what you have in your hand, God says, I got something a whole lot better for you. God will never ask you to give up something without giving you something better. I, I believe that with, with all of my heart. God has great things ahead for us. All we have to do is believe it and receive it in his holy name. Here's a verse from 2 Corinthians. God, who commanded light to shine in the darkness. Genesis, let there be light. And I think that light came as a part of the extension of his glory, was transformed into our earthly light. Let there be light, and it shined in the darkness. But that same glorious light has shined in our hearts. The light of the glorious gospel has come into our hearts and lives. And then you have to make up a mind to receive the light or to walk away from the light. But it shined in our hearts, and here's what it brings. To give light of the knowledge of the glory of God. God wants you to know what everything Jesus had, you're gonna have. That resurrected body that walked out of that grave, that resurrected body that appeared in the upper room, that resurrected body that arose and ascended into heaven, that's what we're gonna have. I hope I'm alive when the trumpet sounds because I want to take that flight. Now, the angels carried my dad to heaven and that's awesome. Yeah. I've told people I'm going to ask sometime, maybe I won't, but I think I'm going to ask the Lord, you know, salvation was so awesome, but why didn't you have a better exit plan for your kids? I mean, isn't there something better way than cancer to get your kids 
to leave. I mean, Enoch just walked with God and he just walked right into heaven. Or Elijah, he got a chariot of fire. I mean, you sent a limo to pick Elijah up. I mean, I don't know, he sends his angels to take us and I don't understand that. I, I remember asking, I don't know why so many Christians experience all of this. My brother-in-law the other day said, well, I know why. Because Satan thinks he's still the god of this world. And he's out to kill and steal and destroy. Because his ultimate goal is to destroy the faith that you have in your heart. He can't get there. It's sealed. So he comes against your mind, your emotion, or your body. Jesus said, do not fear him who can kill the body only. That's all he can do. He can put thoughts in your head. And he can bring destruction to your body. But don't be afraid of him. Be afraid of the one who can not only kill the body, but cast the soul into hell. That's God Almighty. That's the one we should revere. God's people should never be afraid of the devil, but I believe you should be mad at him. He comes to steal, and he steals way too much. Twelve-year-old justice. Satan's out to steal that young man's life. And his ultimate goal is to get mom and dad to deny their faith in God, like Job's wife. Why don't you just curse God and die? Just abandon your faith. That's his goal. But God's glorious light has shined in our hearts, and we've come to have a knowledge and understanding of his plan. And by receiving Christ, Christ has made unto us wisdom, peace, joy, eternal life. See, because eternal life is in Jesus. So when you have Jesus here, you've got eternal life. I mean... Jerry and Butch had trees loaded with apples here a couple of years, and they, they were just hundreds of them out there. But um, I could look at them and appreciate them, but there was nothing to compare with eating one. Because not only was it out there, I got it on the inside. The things of God don't benefit you out there, and God in heaven and Jesus on the cross don't benefit till you get it on the inside. We sing that as kids. Into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. That's it. It's just that easy. And that knowledge, that light is shined into us by a pastor, a teacher, a parent, a grandparent, a friend. Now that we've received it, we're to pass it on to other people. Because here's what happens. He's called us to receive his son, Jesus Christ. And to the ones who called and received Christ, then be justified. We have right standing with God. I've heard somebody say a definition of justified is just as if you'd never sinned. Just as if you'd never sinned. We're clean. We're white. The blood of Christ cleanses us over and over continuously from all sin. So he called us. We received Christ. He's justified us. And here's the good part. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There's a glory about us. We don't have the fullness of it yet, but boy, it's available. It's waiting for us to put on our suit like the Iron Man kid. He wasn't much of anything special till he put his suit on and then he had all these awesome powers, and so are we. We're going to put off this old earthly dead body, and we're going to put on that new glorious body, clothed, filled, saturated with the glory of God. Whom he called, he justified, and the ones he justified, he's glorified. And I quote a scripture on here too, Colossians. Christ in us is our hope of glory. We're going to have that. We're going to share that with him. You know, really, there's two parts to salvation. God's part, our part. God's part, our part. Here's his part. He's able to keep you from falling. He's called us. He's justified us. And we have those great promises on the inside of us. He's able to keep you from falling. See, when Jesus said he was going to be taken and crucified, Peter pulled out his sword. That's never going to happen. And Jesus said, Peter, you don't realize what spirit you're talking about here because this has to happen. This is part of God's plan. 
And Jesus told Peter this, and I think it's true for you. It's definitely true for me. Jesus said, Peter, Satan is desired to sift you like wheat. Satan is desired to take you and rattle and shake you and smash you down. Satan wants to destroy you utterly. Dave got down to that point, didn't you? And when you get that weak, you realize, I'm nothing without him. I can't fight this on my own. We can't overcome Satan on our own, but Revelation 12, or, uh, 11, 12, 12, 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word in their testament. We can, but we have to receive Christ, cleansing by his blood. We have to renew our minds so that more of your prayers and conversations are based on scripture than hearsay, heresy, or your own human thoughts. We need to speak the word, we need to pray the word, we need to live the word. The word of God is our weapon. We overcome him because of the word that's in our testimony. The reason so many Christians have trouble dealing with the devil is they don't have enough word in them. We got salvation, got forgiveness of sin, but God's plan is for us to grow. He said, you're like newborn babies and you need some of the milk of the word, but you need to grow up and get past the milk and go on to the meat and the heavy stuff so that you're strong enough to resist the devil. God's able to keep you from falling. He told Peter, Satan's desired to sift you like, but I have prayed for you. She told Peter, I'm praying for you. See, as much as Dave appreciates all the prayers of the people here, um, the fact is Jesus sitting right beside the Father praying, Lord, watch over Dave Downey. It's not his time yet. I got things for him to do. Father, send your angels. Keep him safe. Rich. Very grateful for all the prayers of the people here. Very grateful. Tell everybody thanks. Because that way you know you're not alone. But I tell you, the most important thing is Jesus who prays for us. And one of my favorite scriptures, part of his prayer in John in Gethsemane said, Father, I pray that they will come to realize that you love them just as much as you love me. Now, that's an awesome thing that God would love Tim, in spite of all of his faults, that God would love Tim as much as Jesus, who had no faults. Now, even more amazing is the fact that he loves Jim Bauer with all of my faults and shortcomings and failures. He loves me just as much as Jesus. It's just an incredible, amazing truth. He's able to keep you from falling. And here's the good thing, present you faultless. See, when you stand before God, you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to worry about your past. Your sins are forgiven. They're put in a sea of forgetfulness. They're erased from the book. God's not going to bring them up again. And we stand before God. We will be faultless before the presence of his glory. And boy, are we going to be happy about all of that. Exceeding great joy. That's God's part. Jesus died for us. And the Father's going to keep us and make sure we're ready for that day. Here's our part. Therefore, in light of what God's done for you, therefore, whatever you eat or drink, or like this little girl, if you're dancing, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. What is it that our kids have to do for us to be happy about it? I remember walking into my girl's bedroom, watching them laying in the crib, and they're just laying in the bed, <laughs> making all these funny faces in their sleep, and I just, I love that. They're not doing anything, but I just, wow. If we delight as earthly parents in our kids and grandkids, how much more is the Heavenly Father delight, whether it's a ball game or around a golf or a fishing trip? Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Get in the habit of talking to God all day long. You can't pray all day because we got jobs and we got things to do. But don't let four or five hours go by without talking to the Lord. Don't let a whole day go by without talking to the Lord. 
live in the presence of God. He's with you. He's listening to you. Talk to him. I mean, Kevin, how long could you ignore Amy and, and not be in trouble? 24 hours? 12? Half a day? If, if our earthly relationships require communication, how much more the Father? Sad to say, I think that a lot of Christians don't talk to God other than Sunday to Sunday. My dad would be sitting over there in the middle of the day trimming meat on his stool and he's trimming away. And all of a sudden he'd just go, oh, glory to God, hallelujah. And he'd just start praising the Lord over there on his chair. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Make God a part of everything you do. It says, Abraham did not stagger at the promises of God, but he was strong in his faith. How? They go together. He was strong in his faith, giving glory to God. See, praise God even before it happens. Because God calls the things that be not as if they were. This operation is going to go successful. This cancer is not going to destroy my faith. This problem is not going to overcome me. Speak faith. He staggered not. He didn't let go of the promises, but he gave glory to God. Believe in, well, Hebrews says there are those who died in faith, never receiving the promise, but they believed it happened after their body died. If you want something from God, just keep believing, 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 believing. Talk about it as if it already happened. See, Jesus is the first begotten from the dead, the firstborn. He's the prince of all the kings of the earth. He's over everybody, everything. And he loved us. He died for us. He washed us from our sins. And here's what he wants to do with you. He's going to make you a king and a priest. There's King Maggie over there. They're not going to be male and female in heaven. We're all going to be like Jesus. We're going to be like him. Uh, king Steve in the back corner over there. God's got great thing and priest. He's going to make a priest. Tom and Vicky Russell are going to make off some ministers of God. You might struggle getting in front of people now, but boy, when you get that old glory and anointing from God, man, the word's just going to come rolling out. We'll have the mind of God, and we'll know all these scriptures, and the word of God's just going to roll out from us. We've made kings and priests because it says when Jesus comes back. He's coming in glory. He's coming in clouds of glory. He was born, the angel said, glory to God in the highest. He was baptized, and the glory of God descended on him. And after his resurrection, he was exalted with glory and honor. And when he comes back, he's coming with glory. Because he's going to share that with us. We're going to not only behold his glory, we're going to experience that glory. It says he will be glorified in his saints. It says he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. You know, the joy that was set for him was to see glory in Jerry and Butch. They have a little bit of it now. We get a little taste of the Holy Spirit. But the glory of God's going to fill us and saturate. And everything that he is on Resurrection Sunday, we're going to be. We're going to have that. Because he's going to be admired by all of those who believe. So this Easter, I want to challenge you. Give glory to God. Whether it's at your meal table. Pray. Celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Uh, give him glory. Because he's coming back to reign and rule on the earth. And we're going to reign with him. Kings and priests on the earth. Glory. Glory. So when we say glory to God in the highest... We're going to experience that. I want you to have a little taste of that today. He's coming back with that glory, but the sad thing is, men on this earth are going to be scorched with hate, and those that have blasphemed God are going to see the wrath of God poured out, but they will not repent. They will not give him the glory. See, that's the criteria. We're giving him glory by honoring and serving his word and having a relationship with his son. But those who refuse to give God the glory are going to get his wrath. 
if we give him glory and honor and place in our lives as Savior and Lord, we're going to share his glory. Everything that he is, we will have. And we're going to live in a city where they don't need light. You don't need light. There are no street lights on the streets of heaven. Because the glory of the Lord lights the whole place. The glory of God is just everywhere there. We don't need a sun and moon. I think they'll be here for people on earth. But in the new city, there's no electrical grid. There's no light poles. There's no internet connection. Everything that God is, we're going to be connected to. We're going to be plugged into him. And everything that he is, we're going to have to be a share also. The glory of the Lord lights the city, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So I want to challenge you this Easter and for the rest of your life. Honor God. Give him glory. Talk to him. Honor him. Praise him. Uh, you know, when you're really proud of somebody, you brag on them. I'm really proud of my dad, so it's easy for me to brag on him. If you're really proud and happy of Jesus Christ, tell people about it. Brag on him a little bit. He loves you very much. Whether you eat, drink, or dance, whatever you do today, give glory to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Christ, your salvation, your anointing, and the glory that's going to be revealed in us. We get a little taste of that with forgiveness of sin and the Spirit of God that dwells in but we have this dying body, this fleshly body that keeps to draw us away. And Lord, help us to be purpose in our mind, in our heart and mind. We're going to serve God. As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. We're going to give glory to God. We'll give the glory to Jesus and tell of his love. Father, I thank you for each one here today. I pray your rich blessing on them, their families, children, grandchildren. Lord, I thank you. Let us go forth sharing and revealing the glory to God in the midst of a dying world. Father, I thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that Jesus lives. Thank you that he lives within us. Lord, I pray your word, your plan, your purpose be accomplished in us. I claim that and I receive that in Jesus' name. If you agree, say amen. Happy Easter. Our Lord lives, and I know because he lives in me.